something is wrong here. Did you ever see pictures like the one I've got displayed up here? It says something's wrong here. If you could read the fine print, it says there are 28 things wrong with that picture. I just cannot believe it because I can find like three. <laughs> Only things I can find wrong with that picture is the leaves are all blowing the winds this way, the smoke's blowing that way. I think on the, the gate, the man's shadow is blowing that way, is going that way, and the gate's shadow is going this way. I think there's a horse plowing a field without a man behind it. Can you, you know, I always have trouble solving those things. They're, they're difficult, but they're interesting because it's got something is wrong in the picture. Let's see another one. I was able to figure this next one out. Even I could figure that one out. I know that there are only seven days a week unless you listen to the Beatles and they say there was eight days a week. But let's, here's another picture. Let's do this next one. Uh, the, the color scheme is so beautiful. A nice interior decorator going here. Uh, but you can see that there's a giraffe in the living room. That is out of place. There's something wrong here. And the, the, some are subtle and some are obvious. This one's going to be... That's really subtle there, you know. You, You've got dolphins jumping in the ocean. Uh, Cows don't usually jump in the ocean. I can figure that one out. All of these pictures have... There's there's one other picture I want to show you, and this is the picture of today. And I want to suggest to you that just like those other pictures, there's something wrong in this picture. There's something out of place. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I want to use for my outline, an outline that Fred Craddock used. He said that the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, is about a parade, a protest, and a procession. So that's where I'm going to go with this, a parade, a protest, and a procession. First of all, it was a parade. You can see from the the parade, you know, there are happy people there. There are children before this person coming into Jerusalem. They are throwing their blankets and garments on the ground in front of him. There are people that are happy in the crowd because these people were excited about Jesus of Nazareth who was coming to Jerusalem. They were excited about Jesus generally. For three years now, he has been developing his ministry. More and more people were hearing about him. His influence was becoming greater and greater. And the people had decided that he was the one. There was talk that he was the Messiah. There was talk that he would be the next great leader of Israel. And in the back of their mind, they were remembering Judas Maccabeus. Most people in church pews don't remember Judas Maccabeus, but he was very important in Israel's history. 160 years before Jesus, the people of Israel were slaves to an empire called the Seleucid Empire. And this Judas Maccabeus was a common man among the Jewish people. He started gathering guerrilla movements and forces, and eventually they overthrew the Seleucid Empire. Israel won their independence and were an independent nation for a hundred years until, through the circumstances of events that we don't have time for, they came under the influence of Rome. And so for a long time now, they had been under the thumb of Rome. And people were thinking, if we just had a Judas Maccabeus to come. There were some others. It's interesting as you read the New Testament. The the book of Acts talks at times about a, a Jewish leader that would try to start an uprising against Rome. And it was always unsuccessful. So when Jesus came along and was this powerful, prophetic preacher, a man from God, the one thing they knew about themselves was that God wanted their their nation to be an independent nation, separate from Rome, and all they needed was the right leader. If the right leader would show up, everyone would get behind him, and they would overthrow the oppression of Rome, and they would be free again. And here was Jesus, who had preached in Galilee and gathered thousands of people around, but now he was coming to the seat of power in Jerusalem. And as he came in, 
They had visions of independence. They had visions of a military fight against Rome. Not only they in the crowd, but also the disciples. Do you remember that one of the disciples was named Simon the Zealot? The Zealots were a political organization in the time of Jesus who wanted to militarily overthrow Rome. And they were all about guerrilla warfare. And one of the disciples was this military-minded guy. I think all of the disciples misunderstood Jesus and thought that perhaps he was going to establish an earthly kingdom. Not long before the triumphal entry, James and John have cornered Jesus and said, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, can we sit one on your right and one on your left side? Because They were envisioning this kingdom. And now, on this day, this Palm Sunday, they were waving their branches. They were shouting from the psalm, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of Luke translates that passage, and it doesn't say in Luke, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. It says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They were thinking... What the choir has sung, the king is coming into Jerusalem. This is an exciting new beginning for all of them. And they knew how kings entered Jerusalem because they had seen it many times. There was a custom to have a parade with great leaders. Sometimes it was a powerful general who was overseeing a battle. Sometimes it was the local rulers, sometimes it was the Caesar who would come into Jerusalem at a long parade. Perhaps it was after a battle against their enemies and they would be at the front of the parade might be the spoils of war, all kinds of things that they had captured and brought back and were bringing home. There might even be uh, soldiers from the enemy forces that were humiliated to march down the streets. There would then be perhaps some that they had captured that were going to now be slaves. And then there would come the powerful army marching in to the praise of all the people because they had won this battle. And at the end of the parade was the emperor, we'll say on this occasion, was Caesar coming in. And the Caesar would always ride on a magnificent white war horse. We are familiar with beautiful horses as Keeneland is starting up. You've seen, perhaps you've been there already. I've seen a picture in the newspaper of gorgeous, gorgeous horses. These thoroughbreds inspire you to no end. Imagine that they have found the most beautiful, the most powerful, the most spirited white horse for the emperor to ride on. That horse lends to the emperor dignity and power and he comes in riding successfully victoriously into Jerusalem it was a parade to end all parades so you can imagine the puzzle on the look puzzled look on the face of the disciples when Jesus tells them guys we're getting ready for the parade into Jerusalem I want you to go down to the main street and there you're going to find what I'm going to ride. It's not a war horse. It's a donkey. And they thought, what? Something is wrong here. They may have even thought it funny. Do you remember what the King James Version of the Bible calls donkeys? It's an honest word. It's a word that makes fourth grade boys snicker on the back row. And it may have been that kind of joke among the disciples. He wants us to bring what? He's going to ride what? Where is the white stallion? This something wrong with the picture is the point of the story. Jesus was saying, I am going to be the king, but not one like you expect. The second thing that Fred Craddock says this story is about is a protest. And we lead quickly into that. In the protest, I would point 
to some of the people in the crowd, some of those men in the back corners that are not having smiles on their faces. There's something wrong with this picture. There were some Pharisees in the crowd, and they were watching all the excitement. They were watching Jesus coming in. And instead of smiles, instead of waving their palms, instead of throwing their cloths on the ground and celebrating the king coming in, they had frowns on their faces. There may have even been, in somewhere in the crowd back there, some Roman representatives because these people were not happy that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem and that they were saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They were not happy about that at all. Jesus was coming to Jerusalem to confront the powers that be. Everything about Jesus' ministry was a threat to Rome. It was a protest. He was there to protest the emphasis on power, the emphasis on oppression, the, all the wrong emphases of the people of Rome. He was also there to protest the mistakes that the Pharisees were making. They had made their religion far too showy, far too empty of real piety and division. It was all an outside kind of thing. He was coming to throw a revolution, not only to Rome, but also to the Jewish faith, to the people there. He saw things that were wrong, and he proclaimed something different. He said, instead of power, I am coming to bring peace. He rides, instead of a war horse, a peaceful donkey. He says, instead of dominion over the people, I am come to bring devotion to God. Instead of coming with pomp and circumstance, I come with prayer and compassion. Love, he says, is at the heart of honest relationships with one another. Not power and prestige and outward show. Jesus would tell a story like, that would have an equally surprising point. One, he told about two people who came into the temple to pray one day. One of those was the Pharisee who was decorated in all his religious garb, who could speak most eloquently and say a prayer that would astound everybody if you heard the eloquence of his words. But there was something wrong in this picture. Far over in the corner was a very poor man named, called a publican. That publican was praying too. That publican was such a sinner, so distraught that he cries out to God, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus looked at this scene and said, there's something wrong here. Who went home justified? Not the pious man who makes a show of his religion, who thinks he's so good. It is this simple, humble sinner. Jesus says, I come to bring that kind of understanding of God. He came to overthrow not just Rome so that Israel could be free, but to confront the powers of domination, the powers that be, and to show them what the world will be like when God is king and Caesar is not. And that's what the Romans heard. What do you mean when Caesar is not? What are you doing coming into Jerusalem? Never forget that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem led to what is going to happen, as we all know, on Friday. They killed him because he came into Jerusalem with this talk of being a king, with this talk of a new kind of heartfelt religion rather than an outward religion, and people turned against him. Which brings us to the third thing that is wrong with this picture. The third thing that Fred Craddock says this story is about is it about a procession, and by that he means it is about a funeral procession. For on that picture, you will see, the other thing that is really strange is Jesus and the look on his face. What are you supposed to do when you come riding in a parade? You've seen parades through downtown Danville. 
And when you go through the parade, the Great American Brass Band Parade, we've got the band playing, we've got dignitaries come, and what do they do? They're doing their parade way. They're smiling broadly. They're saying, hi, they're trying to get votes. They're doing this. What is Jesus doing? None of that. Because Jesus is riding that donkey with a somber look of foreboding on his face. There's something wrong with this picture. Because Jesus knows what is going to happen for three times already. In the Gospel of Mark, it is in chapter 8, verse 31, chapter 9, verse 31, chapter 10, verse 31. Jesus tells his disciples, look guys, we're going up to Jerusalem and there the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and he will be persecuted and he will be killed. Jesus knew that when he confronted the powers of B, they would not take it lightly and he knew this was a serious, serious matter and would end in his death. Jesus face is something wrong with this picture. This is the first day of Holy Week, and I want to talk about the punctuation marks of Holy Week, because each day is an important day in this week. This day, I'm going to suggest we end this day with a comma. It's like a sentence that has begun, but then there's a pause And you know there is something yet to come. Palm Sunday ends with a comma. There's more to come. We will get to Thursday night and the Monday Thursday service, which will be a time when we remember that Jesus gathered his disciples for that last supper in the upper room. And that was an important event, but there's still something coming and you can almost feel the weight of what is going to happen the next day, I'll suggest we end that day with an ellipsis with three little dots that also indicate it's almost here, but it is still to come. On Good Friday, we know what will happen on Good Friday will be the crucifixion of Christ and the disciples and all of those in this crowd who were expecting something great to happen when Jesus came into Jerusalem will all go away with a puzzled look on their face after the crucifixion and Good Friday, I'll suggest we end that day with a big question mark. Was Jesus even who he said he was? What does this all mean? It was to be 24 or 48 hours of great confusion. It's a day that ends with a question mark. And then, of course, we will come to next Sunday, which is Easter Sunday. And what's the appropriate punctuation for that is an exclamation mark when Jesus rises from the dead and to gather, together we will gather and say, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us pray. Oh God, we confess to you that on this day it's easy for us to wave the palms and talk about Jesus coming in without understanding all of the dynamics of what was going on. We can see the picture and and think, oh, isn't that sweet? And not realize that there is something wrong. There are several things wrong with this picture. For Palm Sunday, we shout hosannas. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But, Lord, we also have deep foreboding on us. Bless us this week as together we experience all the punctuation marks of Holy Week and bring us together again next Sunday when we can celebrate with an exclamation mark. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We are disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. As part of the one body of Christ, we welcome all to the Lord's table as God has welcomed us. 
This morning I'm wearing a very special cross that has a very special significant meaning to me. It is the Jerusalem cross. It's also known as the Sojourner's cross. This cross was given to me when I became an elder for the very first time at Harrodsburg Christian Church. It has special meaning in the process of going through and spiritually meditating on the process and the decision I made to become an elder. The responsibilities that come along with that, which have greatly influenced.